World War II brought the globe some of the best aeronautical engineering designs ever created. And although many of these innovative designs definitely pushed all boundaries, several of them never made the cut. One of these unusual designs was the Curtis Wright XB-55 Ascender. This was a strange-looking plane, so much so that it appeared to have been put together backward or in the dark. Warplanes, just like soldiers, rarely become famous for the work they do in training. But out of hundreds and hundreds of experimental aircraft built during the war, the Ascender proved to be an exception to this rule. The prototype actually served as inspiration for several models that came after it. The Ascender was moderately successful during its testing period due to its excellent handling and stability. The plane even had an innovative safety device to disengage its rear propeller during ejection to avoid pilot injuries. However, there were critical flaws that emerged when the Ascender flew at low speeds. The plane also had problems with engine cooling, and most of its prototypes were destroyed in inauspicious accidents. That it never entered production is probably for the best for all the pilots involved. An unusual design. During the 1940s, the United States was recognized as a pioneer in warplane design after playing catch-up in the early years of World War II. Granted, many of these models never went past the test prototype phase. Some of these new designs were too experimental, or at times, entirely useless. Of the hundreds of blueprints from different American companies, most never stood a chance of becoming operational or actually contributing to the war effort. The Curtis XP-55 Ascender was one of these cases. In November of 1939, the U.S. Army Air Corps issued the Circular Proposal R-40C. The Corps requested a fighter with unmatched speed, a great rate of climb, seamless maneuverability, plenty of space for armament, and excellent pilot visibility. On top of all those requirements, the potential fighter also had to have a low initial cost, and it needed to be inexpensive to maintain. The Army explicitly mentioned in the proposal that they would highly consider aircraft with unique designs. Over 50 responses from all over the country came in. Out of those, Four of the proposals were considered worthy of further investigation. These were the designs submitted by Curtis, Bell, Northrop, and Vulte. The Curtis Wright Company's entry was perhaps one of the most unconventional designs of the four finalists. With a rear-mounted pusher prop, it almost looked like it was built backward. Now retired Chief Master Sergeant Leonard M. Christensen recalled the experience of sitting in the plane's cockpit to the Defense Media Network, saying, quote, I was glad I was an engineer and not a pilot. The pilot's seat was way forward, and just behind it was that propeller. We were told it could be jettisoned in an emergency, but what if it refused to cooperate? I could almost, but not quite, reach back and touch the propeller. The XP-55 had a low-mounted swept-wing design, and was equipped with a completely retractable tricycle undercarriage, the first ever used in a Curtis fighter. Its projected maximum speed was no less than 507 miles per hour. The company proposed to power the aircraft with a new Pratt & Whitney liquid-cooled engine, the X-1800A3G, which would be mounted right behind the pilot's cockpit. In the summer of 1940, Curtis Wright received an official Army contract for preliminary cost estimation investigations and a powered wind tunnel model. The project was designated as P-55. By November, Curtis had already completed 25% of its scale-powered model and had designed two different options for the swept-back wings, one with a conventional airfoil, and the other one with a more futuristic-looking low-drag laminar flow airfoil. The exhaustive wind tunnel tests began that same month, and continued through January 1941. When the U.S. Army Air Corps was not completely satisfied with the model test results, Curtis Wright decided to build a full-scale flying airframe with their own money. From November 1941 to May 1942, the full-scale model logged close to 200 flights at Morocco Dry Lake. These tests were promising and full of potential. And so on July 10, 1942, the Army Air Corps finally issued a contract for three prototypes. All would be equipped with the Allison V-1710 engine, as the Pratt & Whitney H power plant production had been shut down. The Curtis XP-55 experimental fighter was officially named the Ascender, but true to the American troops' endless wit and imagination, it quickly became dubbed the Ass Ender, due to its pusher-style configuration. The Prototypes the first official XP-55 Ascender was finished on July 13, 1943, and it was almost identical to the final self-funded model. It made its maiden flight six days later from the Army's Scott Field near the Curtis Wright St. Louis plant. Curtis's official test pilot was J. Harvey Gray. The initial testing revealed several problems. First, the takeoff run was too long. To solve this, the Ascender's nose elevator was increased in size. The aileron up trim was also joined with the flaps to operate smoothly when the flaps were lowered by the pilot. 
on November 15, 1943, as the test pilot flew the XP-55 through stall tests, the aircraft flipped over on its back and began an uncontrolled descent. When recovery was deemed impossible by Gray, he was able to parachute to safety after falling for over 16,000 feet. But by that time, the second XP-55 prototype had almost been completed, so any significant changes in its configuration would have to wait for the third model. Thus, the second model was almost exactly similar to the first one, but with an even larger nose elevator, an adjusted elevator tab system, and a switch from balance tabs to spring tabs on the fighter's ailerons. This prototype conducted its maiden flight on January 9, 1944. By then, all the test exercises were limited due to the previous accident. Stall testing was avoided, until the third model had been more thoroughly vetted. The third prototype first flew on April 25, 1944. It was fitted with four machine guns, and it incorporated some of the improvements recommended after the investigation into the accident of the first ascender. After several other modifications, the stall tests were finally performed with satisfactory results. However, the lack of any warning prior to the stall, as well as the excessive loss of altitude needed to return to level flight, were undesirable characteristics for a fighter. And so an official stall warning device was introduced by Curtis to try and correct the problem. Between September and October 1944, the second XP-55, which had been fixed and altered to the same standards as those of the third prototype, began official USAAF trials. These tests indicated that the Ascender had excellent handling characteristics during both level and climbing flight. Still, it had elevator problems when at low speeds and landing. Engine cooling was also an issue. A tragic accident. Despite the plane's several issues, Captain William Glasgow flew it at a parade on the legendary Wright Airfield on May 27, 1945. That afternoon, in front of 100,000 people, a Commando, an F-38 Lightning, and even a B-29 Superfortress performed tricks in the air. That day, the country was celebrating Germany's defeat, which had only happened 20 days prior. At around 4 p.m., several of the planes were set for a flyby at the same time. Captain Glasgow, a veteran pilot and Purple Heart recipient who fought almost 100 battles in the European theater during the war, jumped into the Ascender's cockpit and set out for the flight. After completing a pass across the field, the pilots were set to make a slow roll. But when Captain Glasgow attempted the maneuver, his plane started to wobble. According to witnesses, it moved so much that many thought it was a planned second roll. The plane flew down close to the ground and tore through several yards of fencing before bursting into a ball of flames. At that same moment, local Wesley Rome was attempting to park his car around to take his small family and a close friend to the show. The Ascender sideswiped right into the side of Rome's car and spilled fuel on it before breaking apart and crashing into a deserted ditch across the road from Wright Airfield. Glasgow survived the incident unharmed. Sadly, when the gasoline ignited, the car and its occupants were caught in the flames. Unsatisfying performance. Ultimately, the Ascender program was shut down as it didn't meet the Army Corps' expectations. It was determined that the plane simply didn't surpass the fighters that were currently in use. The Ascender was an unusual design that may have worked had Curtis had more time. Still, the program was entirely abandoned when the jet engine emerged. The plane became obsolete, no production was undertaken, and further development was abandoned. The only surviving XP-55 Ascender was flown to the Warner Robins Field in Georgia in the spring of 1945. It was later taken to Indiana to await transfer to the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in DC. For decades, its fuselage was on display at the Paul Garber facility in Suitland, Maryland. In December 2001, the Ascender was sent to the Kalamazoo Aviation History Museum for restoration. By 2007, the work was complete, and the plane is now on permanent display at the main campus building of the Kalamazoo Air Zoo. And although XP-55 Ascender is, without a doubt, a spectacular and interesting plane to look at, its performance left much to be desired. <laughs>